Asking for advice can be a pretty hit or miss uh, practice. I mean, we've all probably had examples where we've asked advice from somebody and we've gotten what is probably the most useless piece of advice ever. Oftentimes what I like to describe it as is it's the um, easier said than done, no duh types of advice. My bet is you probably even received some of that this week. I mean, there's some examples. Like um, every now and then, I'll, I'll jump into different groups I'm in, whether it be on you know Facebook groups or on Reddit, and I'll ask for advice on how to like do something that I'm, I'm new to, and I, I want to get some perspective on others who have gone through similar experiences. So you go on there and you ask your advice, and then they give you the biggest, well, of course, types of answers. Like you know, I'm not sleeping well. You know, I'm, I'm snoring a lot. You know, my wife's complaining, like, how can I stop snoring? And the advice is, well, you should probably just lose weight. Cool. Thanks. I, I wasn't aware that losing weight was, was an important aspect of being healthier. Or, or maybe, um, you know, you're having a hard time paying your bills. So you go and you ask somebody for help, like, hey, man, I'm just, I'm really struggling. I, I'm having a hard time making ends meet. It feels like the bills are going up and my pay is not. And, and how, do I, how do I make sure things are taken care of? And the advice you get is, well, just get a better paying job. Cool. I didn't know that more money equaled more money to spend. I wasn't aware that that was a connection. Or maybe, you know, my kids are having trouble in school, mine or not. But maybe this is a question you might ask. You know, my kids are having a hard time in school. Maybe they're getting in trouble. Maybe there's some disobedience issues. Like, how do I help them? And the advice that so often you receive is, well, you should probably just be a better parent. No duh. There's all types of advice that we either give or receive that is kind of that no duh, not helpful advice. It's easier said than done. This morning, we are continuing the series that we are calling The Simple Life. And the goal of this series is really to help us see that there is freedom in simplicity. That we live in a very loud and busy and chaotic life. So how can we as followers of Jesus cut down on things like the excess things that we collect, relying upon possessions and money? How can we uh, get rid of entrapping thoughts and erroneous themes, these things that plague and make our lives complicated? How can we, as the church, as followers of Jesus, live a simple life focused on him? Last week, we, ca- we kicked this series off, and we, we talked about those things how so often in our lives we, we rely on our possessions and our money to be these self-made lifeboats that we can rely on when life goes crazy. So we hoard and we, we amass as much as we can and we hold on to it as if it were to save us. And in reality, possessions, money, come and go. That they are not lifeboats, that the only lifeboat is Jesus and how we as the church are to find our hope and our rest in Jesus, in Jesus alone. That's not to say that possessions and money are bad. It's just that those things do not save us. This morning, we're going to continue this series, and we're going to be in Philippians this morning. So if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to go to Philippians. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 4 this morning. We're going to kick it off in verse 4. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. Picking it up in verse 4, we have this. Always... Be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God that what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. 
The instructions from Paul here essentially can boil down to this. As followers of Jesus, be full of joy. Be full of peace. Pray for everything. Focus your mind on things that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and worthy of praise. That's what you have to do as the church. That's what you have to do as followers of Jesus. That's how you follow Jesus. Talk about easier said than done. Because the truth is, who here who can honestly say, like, you know what, I, I have all the joy I need, right? I'm as joyful as it gets. I'm good. I'm, I'm, my, my tank is full on joy. When it comes to things like peace, I am at, at peace. There's nothing that is affecting me. I am totally full of peace. Who here can honestly say that when it comes to the things that they focus on, they only focus on things that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and worthy of praise. Like, that is me to a T. Right? We all wish we had more of all of these things. It's definitely one of those things that we read about in Scripture and we think, oh, that sounds great. Of course that's what the Bible would say, but it's harder to actually put into practice. Now, let me ask you a personal question. And if you want to just come up and talk, that'd be fine. You know, we'll just expose all of your deep, dark, inner things. How would you describe your spiritual health? Do you read passages like this and you think, you know what, that really describes my walk with Jesus. I'm walking in that. I'm walking in that joy. I'm walking in that peace. I'm walking in all of that honorable and true and right and pure and lovely and all of that. Like that is my relationship with Jesus. Or do you find yourself frustrated that you want those things, but yet that for some reason that you just feel out of grasp? Like you want that joy and you want that peace, but yet all you have is anxiety, frustrations, and, and worry. Something is keeping you from that life. And, and you read these passages and you just find yourself wishing your faith was what it used to be. Like you, you, you flash back to that life before when you first came to Jesus and you had the butterflies. You know what I'm talking about? The butterflies in your stomach when you think about your faith and, and how Jesus is all that your life is meant for and you're just consumed by this relationship with Jesus because it's all new and exciting and you just want that feeling back. You feel like you could just have that life if you just had more time to prioritize things like time with Jesus and this relationship that you have with Jesus. So once a month, I, I meet with a mentor and pastor coach. He's one of those people who um, has the permission to ask me these types of hard questions. And this was a question that was asked of me just two weeks ago. He started off our, our hour-long conversation with, you know, how are you doing? And not just, you know, is your day okay, but like, how is your spiritual health? And I did that thing that I so often do, and maybe you do as well, and maybe you find yourself doing it just a second ago, where I think to myself, yeah, I'm doing good. I'm, I'm fine. Everything's great. So often, we have that knee-jerk reaction just to say we're good. I mean, I'm a pastor, right? Like, I read the Bible all the time. I, I teach it every single week. I'm in the Word all the time. I, you know, I, I like to think that I pray when it comes to mind. Of course I'm good. 
if anyone's going to be good, it's probably the guy who's paid to be good, right? But then he pressed me on it, and I realized how little joy and how little peace I truly felt in that given moment because the truth of it was, while this is typically a conversation that I look forward to every week or every month because it's a life-giving relationship, a life-giving conversation, I found myself just waiting for the conversation to end so I could tackle the list of things I had to do when it was over. I wasn't at peace with the conversation. I just wanted it to get knocked off my to-do list for the day because work was overwhelming and I had to get back to the things that I had to do. The truth is, I was stressed, anxious, overwhelmed. And as we talked through it, I realized that the discontentment that I felt in that moment was because I felt like there was something lacking in my life. Like many of you, I wanted the way things used to be. I was comparing my current rhythms to the rhythms of a healthier person, and I just felt like things should have been the way that they used to be. I missed having the time for Jesus. I missed having time for meditating on Scripture. I missed having the time to practice spiritual disciplines. I missed having the time to study and read for hours. I missed having the time for life-giving relationships. I wanted the way things were. I think another way to look at it is like this. And maybe you can resonate with this as well. I missed when I had time for Jesus. I wish and I missed time to experience joy. I missed when I had time not to worry about things and to spend time in prayer. I missed when I had time for peace. I missed when I had time to fix my thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable and worthy of of praise, all of these things. I wish and I miss the time. Just by a show of hands, who here wishes they had more time for Jesus? Sometimes I read passages like this in Philippians chapter 4, and I have to ask myself if maybe Paul is disconnected from our world. Maybe Paul is writing when life was just simpler in nature, right? Like they didn't have the crushing obligations that we have or we were just overtaxed, over busy. He doesn't understand what it's like to work 50 hours in one job and then come home and be a parent afterwards. He doesn't understand the time limits that we have. So of course Paul can write what he writes here. It was an easier time. He doesn't have the burdens that we have. Do you ever feel like you don't have enough time? If only you could find a way to negotiate with God for a 26-hour day instead of 24. So often, I think we, we read passages like this, and we end up with this crushing sense of guilt that maybe we're just not serious enough about Jesus. That if Jesus were more of a priority in my life, I could balance this better. I wouldn't be so distracted. I wouldn't find myself wasting my time doing frivolous things if I were more serious about my faith. So one of two things usually ends up happening, right? Either we feel that sense of guilt and we, we, we pursue the relationship with Jesus more out of guilt than anything else because it's what we ought to do because it's what Paul tells us to do here. So we, we do everything we can to, to prioritize that, focus on that, but not really to enter into an intimate relationship with Jesus necessarily, but just so we don't feel that guilt. Or we do the opposite. And we just say it's unrealistic. Paul doesn't understand our day and time, and we just kind of give up. And we just say, you know, it is what it is. My relationship with Jesus is what it is. It'll always be the way that it is, and that's just the way it is. So we go to church, and we do our Bible studies, and that's our Jesus.
So often I think we settle for something that lacks any semblance of life because we don't know how to do anything else. Here's what I've been processing. Maybe the issue isn't with time, but rather the way we view intimacy with God. So often, I think when the church today talks about this type of topic, like spirituality, intimacy with God, we we look at it through this Western culture lens that we all have, right? Because we're part of the Western culture. This is just the natural way that we look at things. And so often, we look at faith through this lens that it is mostly an intellectual pursuit, That if we want to be serious about our faith, that is how we need to do it. It needs to be intellectual. It needs to be something in our minds. Another way to look at it, maybe more um, negative in sense, is this. We often find that we think our way into heaven. We want to have intimacy with God, so the reaction is it's time to study. It's time to find something new. It's to search out new facts. If only we could learn something new about this that we didn't know before, that's what it means to grow deeper into faith. It's all about knowledge, facts, trivia. So when we feel dry, when we feel like we are missing that butterflies, we're not having that intimacy with God like we used to have, we're not having those wild magical moments like we did when we were in high school going off to camp or when we were having that that powerful revival thing or or, or we had that powerful sermon or the music just hit just right because we played the blessing that week or you name it. Like we're not having that special moment. The response that we so often have is this. It's time for a new devotion. We need to get a new book to read every morning. Maybe we need to join a new Bible study. Like, that's the way to go forward. Maybe we need to find a new pastor who speaks to my heart in a way that the other one did not. We need to have a new book. We need to carve out more time in our morning. Instead of doing a 20-minute Devo time in the morning, let's up that to, like, 25 minutes. Like, that's surely the secret to intimacy with God. It's just spending more time doing God things. And well, look, the advice this morning isn't that we need to just stop doing those things. Bible studies are great. If you're not in a Bible study, I recommend being in a Bible study. They're important. Having time with God in the Word is important. I'm not saying don't do those things. Find a wise pastor who speaks to your heart. Those are all good things. But I wonder if sometimes we reduce what it means to follow God to those special God times. So often, I think the way we think about faith and this journey that we are on is that we limit God to those moments. I know that was my experience, right? Like, I wanted to be able to experience God the way I used to experience God, which was when I was fully focused on God and nothing else. Sometimes, I think that we, we feel like we can only enjoy God's presence when we are engaging our minds through things like church or Bible studies. The only way we can experience the presence of God is when we do those special God things. This week, as I was reading, I came across this quote by Jan Johnson in a book that I've been slowly processing through called Enjoying the Presence of God. This was a book that was actually recommended to me from that conversation with my mentor. The quote says this. I'll put it up on the screen behind me. Paying attention to God's presence is wider and deeper than thinking about God all the time. It involves the ordinary activities of our entire being, feeling, sensing, listening, and moving in such a way that watering plants, 
playing volleyball, and walking on the beach take on a rhythm of prayer. I think the mistake that we sometimes make when it comes to experiencing the joy and peace of the Lord, the things that we read about in Philippians chapter 4, is that we incorrectly assume that the only way to experience these things is when we do enough to earn it. The only way to experience God in our daily life is if we're doing God things. As I spoke with my mentor about my own spiritual health, I realized that it all circled back to me comparing my current habits to my old ones. I did not feel like I was doing enough and therefore did not believe that I was enough. I had to earn the presence of God. He was only near when I was doing things that drew him near. Sometimes I wonder if we forget the reality that the Lord is always near. Putting it a different way, God is just as near when you're worshiping him here as when you do dishes when you get home. God is just as near when you're reading the Bible as when you're driving to work. God's presence does not change. We don't earn the proximity to the Lord. He is always present. The presence of God is not bound to church services or Bible studies. In reality, the presence of God is near when we are out working with our family, when we're out shopping for groceries, when we're raking the leaves, when we are stuck in traffic, when we're stuck at our desk jobs, when we're frustrated with other people. The Lord's presence is near. The Lord's work is not just the things that we do for him, but it is the work that we do in him, which, if we can just view this intimacy in this way, encompasses all things. The truth is we experience the presence of God in ways that so often we don't even realize. Just take a moment. Think back over the last few days. Where was the Lord's presence? In the random interactions that you have with others, in the people that you encounter, the Lord's presence was there. And yet we so often go through the busyness and we miss it because we are not living that simple life that we are talking about in this series. The Lord's presence was with you when you had an argument with your significant other. The Lord's presence was with you when you were at work. I think what we need to get in the practice of doing is to see that presence, to see where he is in the midst of our lives. The issue isn't time. The issue is we don't think simply enough. We make following Jesus to be this convoluted and complicated thing that it's not meant to be. What Paul's words here in Ephesians chapter 4 are really about is as you go through your life, the peace and, and, and joy of the Lord are available to you because you rest in his presence no matter where you are. It's not just confined to when you're reading this. It's not confined to when you're in services. It's not confined to when you're, you're having small group or Sunday school or Bible study. Whatever you call that time, the Lord's presence is there with you. We just need to train ourselves to see it. Which starts with prayer. What if we start training ourselves to pray for the people that we encounter? As you're at work, what if you just start praying for the coworkers around you? What if you start praying for the customers that you see or the clients that you see or the people that you email? What if you were to turn that rhythm into prayer? What if you were to start viewing your life in such a way that the Lord is working in you as you're out doing the busyness of life. So when you're at the grocery store and you encounter somebody, it's an opportunity and a prompting to pray for that person. A quote that's been nagging at me for the last maybe month or so 
is a quote that I read way back when I was in college by Warren Wiersbe. He had a book on leadership, and I can't remember the exact quote, and I probably should have looked it up, but I wasn't planning on talking about it. The quote essentially came down to this idea, so often when we're busy, we, we view people as distractions. Like, I'm focused, I'm trying to get this done, and all of a sudden somebody comes in and they ruin my concentration. Yesterday, I'm trying to write this sermon, and my wife is asking me questions, and I literally told her, you're being a distraction, can you please go so I can finish this? What if we stop viewing people as distractions, and instead view them as the reason for doing what we do? People are not distractions. They are who we are called to be present with. Because that's where the Lord's presence leads us. So what if we started praying this week for those that we encounter, those that we do life with, and help us to see God's presence and where God is leading us as we interact with others? What if we start taking small pieces of Scripture and adding them to a centering aspect of our lives where we kind of repeat them and we pray through them throughout the day as a mantra? As we wrap this up, I want to do just that. We're going to go to uh, Psalm 16. If you have a Bible, go ahead and go to Psalm 16. I'm going to put it up on the screen behind us. And what I would encourage you to do is as we, we read through this and as we kind of pray through aspects of this psalm, if there's a, a verse, a phrase that stands out to you, add that to your prayer rhythm this week. You breathe as a natural rhythm to your, your existence. Your heart beats in a rhythm. What if we were to add this as a prayer in the same facet that we breathe as our hearts beat? That as we go through our day, we repeat these prayers to help us to center on what God is doing in our midst here in this moment even though we're at work or stuck in traffic or at school or, or with our families, wherever it is that we find ourselves, what if we can use these words of the Lord as a prayer to help us to hone in on this simple life? Psalm 16 in the NIV, I just like the way it's phrased better there. It says this, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. So as we pray through this, we will pray. Can you put back one? We pray that the Lord would keep us safe. That no matter where we find ourselves, no matter where our days may take us, that we find refuge in the Lord and the Lord alone. That we resist the temptations to go back to those self-made lifeboats. But we pray to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. The Lord is all that we need. He is the good in our lives. What if we were to take this verse, say, I say to the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom all my delight. What if we were to pray for the holy people, the people who get to do this journey with us and we look for opportunities to celebrate what God is doing with those around us. Pray for mentors. Pray for people to walk beside us through life's ups and downs. Those who run after those are, those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. We pray these types of prayers to help the Lord work in our lives, inviting him to, to keep us from distraction, to not follow the gods of our day, which is so often the self and selfishness, instead to keep our eyes focused on him and his good. Lord, you alone are my portion in my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. We look to the Lord as the sufficiency that we need. In him is all that we need. He is our portion. He is our cup. He is all that we need for security and peace and joy. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. 
We praise the Lord even when the life, life gets at its darkest, when things get at its murkiest, when we are alone, when we are stuck with just us and our thoughts, we still praise the Lord and we realize that his presence is there even in the darkness. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one decay. We look to the Lord to sustain us. We realize that his presence is not conditional. It's not only when we're we're doing the God things, but his presence is there each and every moment. It's a real and tangible thing that we can enter into, that the Lord delights in this relationship with us. There's no aspect of our lives that is not saturated in his presence. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. We invite the Lord to fill us with his presence. So as we go through the busyness of our days, we can repeat that phrase, your presence. It is eternal pleasures. It is this eternal peace. It is the things that we're talking about in Philippians. My hope is that we can take these verses and we can add them to the rhythm of our lives. As we seek to live out the simple life, we can hone, we can hone in on the ever-present reality that God is near always. He's not reserving himself and holding himself only for those special moments when we do the God things, but he is there in present. So often we compartmentalize God and we try to put him in our God box and when we have our other box where we do life, but God is too big to be boxed. There is no God box. Our whole lives is the God box. When we realize that God's presence is all around us, we turn to what Paul writes here in Philippians chapter 4, and we can exchange the stress and the anxiety for joy and peace that only his presence provides. By trying to pursue the simple life, we turn down the volume of condemnation and guilt that we so often feel when it comes to this discontentment we feel. And instead, we embrace the things that are true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and excellent and worthy of praise. Let's pray as we continue to worship. Lord, we thank you so much for this presence, for your presence that is real and a part of our lives. Help us to see your presence in the rhythms of our everyday. Help us to see how you're working in our lives, not just when we're doing Bible study or singing or or here in church or with church people doing the church thing, but in every moment. Help us to see your presence when we're driving to work. Help us to see your presence when we're at the grocery store or doing stuff at home. Help us to see your presence when we're at work or at school. Help us to see your involvement in our lives, in the lives of our family and friends. Lord, we thank you that your presence is real, that your presence is powerful, and that in you we have peace and joy. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us, all that you have done, and will continue to do. We thank you for that presence that drives us and gives us more than we could ever comprehend. Lord, it's your name that we pray. Amen.